Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the program on this gorgeous Wednesday morning. But a reminder that it is already the fourth day of autumn. Yes, winter's around the corner, so we need to be bracing ourselves. And from what the experts are telling us, it's going to be a cold winter. I'm not liking that at all. But great to be with you. We will be together till 10 o'clock and I look forward to all the amazing people that are joining us to talk about their stories. We're going to be talking about the training of guide dogs for the visually impaired. We're also going to be looking at apps to enhance your business and po possibly also personal apps with someone called Ismail Schuster. But right now we're going to talk education and as a sideline, cupping therapy, hijama cupping therapy. She has gone this route. So let's get talking to Zainat Kaji. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Lovely to have you here today for you to come in and share all of your expertise with us. Now let's start right at the beginning. You studied at WITS and you studied as an educator. You're also specializing in two fields that are sorely needed in yes. our country in our communities as well of course we're talking maths and science tell us a little bit about that and why you think that uh, we as south africans have a problem in this area of education okay um, i completed my bachelor of education at the university at fitz i finished in 2015 um, it was a lovely lovely four years i majored in science and english but i did math as a methodology um, I went on to teach at a government school, which I'm still there and I'm still really enjoying it. Um, you really, really do reap the rewards of a government school. Uh, I am teaching maths and I have been ever since I started. Um, it's been daunting as well because, you know, you see the problems, you see how much you give as an educator, how much prep time you do, how many lesson plans you do, how much time you actually spend talking, uh, standing, you know, putting so much of effort into organizing visuals, organizing extra resources for the learners. But, you know, there has been a major, major problem, especially in mathematics at the moment. What do you as a teacher of this specific subject believe is the problem? Where and how does this gap come about? I too battled <laughs> with maths and arithmetic at school. I just could not get my head around yes. it. To be honest, Julie, I think that, you know, today kids do not put in enough time and that's where it all started from you know I remember as a child um, my late mom she used to draw me with my timetables you know that mental maths component was so so important we you know every night I have timetable tests and I'll have to know everything and I think parents don't understand it's not just about the methods that we teach the kids why do they have to know three methods of multiplication why do they have to know four methods of um, adding three digit by three digit numbers you know there's so many things to it but they don't understand that if your child is good with their mental maths if they know their timetables if they know that inverse operations are of division is multiplication and subtraction is addition if they can grasp those things initially they will be fine and they will go through everything with ease and I'm not just saying that because I'm the teacher you know I know my kids who actually do well in their mental maths and um, get really good marks in that they really really thrive in other assessments I'm really going to be killing two birds with one stone in this interview with you because in the first part I'm going to try and concentrate on this issue with maths okay. and how we overcome sure. it and inshallah after the break um, we'll be okay. concentrating on uh, hijama cupping. Okay. Let's go back to the issue around maths. Um, okay. In this day and age of technology, yes. is it all important to be able to ace maths number one and number two um, you know with calculators mm -hmm. handheld mm -hmm. calculators and calculators on our cell phones yes, yes. and kids are using these devices yes. at school is it still very important and imperative perhaps yes. for them to get their heads around yes. uh, mental maths you know, Julie, I would say most definitely, without a doubt, because yes, um, there is the, the use of iPads and these apps and things, but I feel like kids aren't using it to the advantage. There are so many apps out there who, which enhance your math skills, which enhance and test that ability of mental maths. But at the end of the day, you know, you don't walk around every day with a calculator. I know our cell phones are at our fingertips, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, it's still not going to give you the edge that people who have a good um, foundation of mental maths in their mind you know, they have an extra edge to it. What is this mental math that you're referring to? Well, uh, 
in that, I'm talking about your timetables, I'm talking about division. Which you like need to know offhand, yes, you need yes. to know by memory, you have to memorize the stuff. Yes, definitely. And as a child, it should be, um, it really should be installed in a very early age. You know, because I know now as adults, when we're in our 20s, 30s and 40s, we all know our timetables. You know, we know what 6 times 6 or 4 times 8. It's not I difficult. I still don't know them, but that's fine. <laughs> I walk around with a yes. cell phone. Let's talk about the um, early years of a child, yes. the developmental years, obviously. Yes. What, do you, what would your suggestion be for moms to get their kids? Because, you know, we're very yes. eager. The child is two and three years yeah, old and yeah, we take up yeah. all of the books and building yeah, blocks yeah, and yeah. we try and teach them numbers and the alphabet, etc. What would you suggest they do in trying to get the child interested in maths yes. or learning number concepts, yes. etc.? What is the key or the trick, mm -hmm. you know, in those formative years of a child's life? Yes. Um, there's a lot of resources at our fingertips. I wouldn't um, instantly say refer, like go to your iPad, use your iPad because it's there. And every today, every toddler even I'm has talking an about iPad. The little, no, I'm talking about a toddler. What age. do we do to teach them? Um, I would say invest in an abacus. These are going back to olden things, even though I'm not an elderly person, but I still think they work. You know, abacus, tie-ins, blocks, those things where they need to know how do I put like four groups of 10. They need to know a lot of the children don't understand what's the difference between four groups of 10 or 10 groups of four. You know, and from that age, you need to develop those things. It may sound like a small thing, but those are things you can teach them from a young age. You know, so investing in something like Diane's Cubes or an abacus what simply cubes? would work. It's called Diane's Cubes. Okay. Or yes. anything like, yes. I know there's a whole host of programs yes. out there. When my kids were small, they had uh, some hippie, called hippie programs okay. and all sorts yeah, of programs yeah, yeah. to teach the children yes. color, number, um, yes. you know, um, uh, alphabets, etc. Mm. all these different mm. concepts. I'm not sure if it really worked. Yes. And I spent time with the um, kids, but... Yeah. You know, whether they had mm. a, an advantage mm -hmm. over other children or an edge, I can't um, lay any claim yes. to that. But you as an educator. Um, Julie, I wouldn't recommend something television based, you know, because that's more seeing. That's like olden style teaching where everything is um, teacher orientated. You know, the teacher does all the talking, all the child does is sit back and listen. It needs to be more learner based where the child themselves goes and does. You know, it's more about them doing, because that's how you learn, through doing, not through just watching. What about tactile learning? There's a big yes, emphasis yes. on that as well. I would say that that would work, that would work. And I understand that, you know, you have to move with the times. Mm. So if the iPad works, go ahead and, you know, get something good for your child. I can't name any apps because... I'm not familiarized with We him, have an but, expert uh, coming in just now. Yeah, Ismail I'm sure Schuster. he can help us with that. <laughs> we'll throw this at him Perfect. as well. Okay, let's look at the issue around science. You seem to be more focused on maths, though you studied science yes, as well. Yes. You majored in it, I presume. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Um, science, I covered three components, physical science, um, life science, and your life science, which is also known as your biology. Um, I did study those that those three sciences in the four years that I completed my um, bachelor's. Uh, it was lovely. It was very, very daunting. A lot of hard work. You know, um, those who have studied university level science know that it's really, really no joke. I did say, like, I can't tell you that I failed a semester or two, but you know, your second semester, luckily you can make it up, make up those marks and ended up passing all four years, alhamdulillah. But uh, it was good. You know, it was just my destiny to go into maths and teach maths. And I would say that I love it more. Mm. You know, I didn't know that I would enjoy it more than I enjoyed science because science had the three components, um, which is uh, physical, chemical and life science. Some kids are absolutely hooked from a very early age yes, and you yes. know that they're going to go on studying science, yes. becoming scientists or medical mm -hmm. professionals, etc. Yes. What do you believe is the hook in getting them into, you know, getting uh, uh, inculcating a passion for science? Yes. And at school level, what is the gap you see as far as the sciences are concerned? Well, I haven't noticed much of a gap in terms of the sciences because I'm a specialist in the senior primary phase. A lot of the sciences is theoretical. Um, they do, they're not introduced into physical science that much, nor are they introduced in into the lab chemistry. situation. Yes, yes. There's small practicals such as the ticket timer. There's small practicals as you know, mixing small things, looking at how um, how to form ammonia, and you know. But a lot of that because I'm in a government school, I'm sitting with 40 learners in a classroom. Oh. You know, um, they don't. We don't have the resources. Actually, you know, we do on a very small scale. But like I said, the teacher is doing a lot 
in a government environment. You know, as the teacher, you are demonstrating because you're sitting with a class of 40 learners, um, time doesn't permit for you to give each child or each group their own one. Also, there's um, a lot of children who are disadvantaged, who don't know how to handle the, that type of equipment as well as how to work safely. You know, the school can provide the chemicals or the um, equipment for it, but they cannot provide the gear. Whereas at the University of Wits, we were given lab coats, you were given the glasses, protective wear, and you need those types of things because if there's spilling, there's, you know, anything can go wrong. You could be and scarred for life. Definitely. And with a class of 40, you have to be on top of your game as a teacher to be able to move quick enough, to be able to, you know, you have to have eyes at the back of your head to see mm, that nothing's true, going wrong. Because, true. I mean, everyone knows today that children do have more rights than you do as a teacher. So um, you have to really uh, protect yourself and you want to protect the kids because you're in it for them at the end of the day. Well, you're quite uh, committed to <laughs> remaining yeah. on in a government school and trying and to sure make that. a difference yes. in the lives of 40 children. Let's go for our, uh, for our first ad break. Zenit Kanji is my guest. She's an educator, as you've heard, passionate about maths. She's also studied science and and she talks about, obviously, the challenges in government schools as far as these subjects are concerned. When we get back from the ad break, we are going to talk about her other passion, and that is hijama cupping therapy. Allahumma barik lana fi rajab wa sha'ban wa balighna ramadan Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. On behalf of Dar Arkham Islamic High School, I wish to say shukran zazilan to the broader community for your generous contributions to the school. Your contribution has afforded Dar Arkham to achieve a 100% metric pass, as well as enabling more learners from impoverished backgrounds the opportunity to attend our school. 70% of the construction of the new building has been completed, and we humbly appeal for your financial assistance in completing the project. Dar Arkham needs your support. Allahumma barik lana fi rajab wa sha'ban wa balighna ramadan Welcome back. Uh, just a reminder that later on in the program we're going to have four guests in the last segment. Uh, two human guests and two guide dogs. So look out for that. We're going to be talking about uh, the importance of guide dogs and the training of guide dogs for the visually impaired. We're also going to be talking about business and personal apps with Ismail Schuster. But right now we are talking to the lovely Zenit Kaji. We've talked about her first passion, which is education, the education of maths. And now we go on to her second passion and that is hijama cupping therapy. Now as soon as you're pretty young to be involved in something like that, how did you decide that this was something for you? Um, you know, uh, Auntie Julie, the first thing is after I matriculated, um, my passion was actually to become a paramedic which a lot of people don't know. Um, but naturally, you know, as uh, our Muslim woman lifestyles and my parents... It's hard work and yes, crazy they, um, hours. They were dead against it, you know, even though they knew it was my passion. And I was always, you know, the brave one in the house and doing insect catching. And, you know, I was never scared of blood and that type of thing. Um, because of my parents' world, well, they weren't so happy with the profession and it wouldn't cater for my lifestyle, looking at it in the long term. Um, then my second choice was education, but somehow, you know, you can't um, block out a passion because it comes back and finds you. And last year, somehow, this cupping ther therapy found me and I've been loving it ever since I started doing it. Now, you obviously had to go for a course. How yes. long was the course and where did you yes. attend the course? Um, I attended it at a hijama center in Indonesia. It was a four-month course. I spent every Saturday morning for about four hours there studying um, Actually, I do have a background in anatomy, like I said, because I did major in science. I had to do anatomy. I had to do, um, uh, I had to study a whole lot of diseases because naturally I'm not a doctor. You know, there's still things that clients come to me and I'm not familiar with it. I still ask them, what is that? 
I had to study um, meridians because as you know, cupping like strongly originates with Chinese medicine. So there's certain meridians that you have to know on the body, certain types of points, how to cut as well. There was a practical examination, a theoretical examination that went hand in hand with that after the four months of studying. I've heard about cupping, but I've yes. never ever gone into the intricacies. I've never had it performed yes. on me. And now you're just talking about cutting. Yes. I didn't realize that there, um, you know, that it's invasive okay. or that, you know, there's uh -huh. some form of instruments that are used yes. apart. I've always kind of imagined some form of a plastic yes. uh, cup type of device that is used on certain points of the body. You're talking cutting yes. on the body. Talk to us about that and does that mean every time someone comes to you for therapy that you're actually having to cut at a certain point on the person's body? Okay, there are three types of techniques used when it comes to cupping. Um, the first one is called massage cupping, uh, which is used um, by applying oil on a certain part of the body and then applying one plastic cup, you're absolutely correct, and sliding it amongst that area. And that is used more for muscle stiffness and muscle aches and pain. So it's more your athletes and your people who go to gym who come to you for that. Uh, the second one is dry cupping, which is good for circulation. And the last one is our wet cupping known as sunna cupping, which is the one where I do the cutting, or I could say just tiny incisions, not actually cutting, and also known as bloodletting. So a lot of our Muslims, our fellow Muslims, come for the, um, the wet cupping, which is sunnah, you know, and Absolutely, naturally yes. we, would, we would say it's the most beneficial. And um, the, the benefits are actually numerous. I don't get much clients for the massage cupping because like I said, it's more towards the athletes and the sports market. And the dry cupping, it's pretty basic because it's done before wet cupping. So first a dry cup is placed on the body. Which so is it happens ultimate. together? Yes, yes okay. it happens together. But if a person does not want to go on to wet cupping, they don't have to. All right, now you talk wet cupping, you talk blood letting. Yes, yes. Um, how big is the incision? All right, let's assume I come to you and yes. I say to you that I suffer from allergies. Okay. Um, you're now going to perform this ritual or this therapy on me. Okay. Take me through the process. What exactly are you going to do? Is there any pre-examination okay. that happens before you start the actual process or procedure? Okay. Well, there is a sort of, I would say, a pre-diagnosis that I would do if someone doesn't know what's their problem. If you come to me, which 90% of the time, most of my clients, they know what's wrong. That's why they're seeking a therapy. You know, the other 10%, I would say it's just for general well-being or it's to fulfill a sunna as well because a lot of the people do just want to do it to fulfill a sunnah. Um, usually it's pressing points on the body like the fingertips or the wrist, certain points where you would say, do you have pain here, do you have pain there? But a lot of my clients, they know why they come. So um, we work a lot on the back and it doesn't have to be that way. The first and foremost rule for anyone who comes cupping or who goes to someone else for cupping, they need to know that the cup has to be applied to the site of the pain. So if you have a leg pain, that's where I'm going to work. All right, now we, pain, I, I, I used myself in this for exa allergies. Yeah, for, yes. for allergies or for a post nasal yes. drip, which is very irritating, very yes. especially yes. this time of year. Yes. What are you going to do for me? I would me? work on your back. I would work on your general organs. Also, there's something known as facial cup facial cupping, which you do on the face as well. Um, you know, I wouldn't really recommend doing incisions on the face, but it's absolutely safe. It's absolutely safe if you go to someone who Where would you make the incision on the face? I would either do it on the sides, it could also Which be done not on visible. the head. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people do mind the marks. That's why they wouldn't want it there. Otherwise, they would opt for sunna points as well, which is very beneficial. And the sunna points being? Um, the sunna points is at the base of the neck, so right. it's at the back of the head. For the males, there's one on the top of the skull and at the back of the skull. For women, not really, because we don't shave our hair. A lot of the women wouldn't choose to shave their hair, as well as four fingers above the hip and on the top of the foot. Just for allergies? Um, no, 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 generally. No, generally, generally. Okay. I try and make it a standard to at least do one sunna point per person, you know, because... It doesn't extra. matter what they come for. No, it doesn't matter what they come so, for. So now I've come to you and you are now treating me for the post-nasal drip. Yes. You make an incision at the back of my neck. Yes. How big is the inc incision and how much blood will be actually let? Um, the incision is about three millimeters, two to three millimeters only. It's literally a tip just with the blade. Um, we usually, for sooner purposes, we opt for odd number of cuts. So I either do three, five or seven. Uh, the amount of blood would usually about two, two caps full. So not even much. A lot of people can't. Caps full. Yes. How big is a cap? Yes. 
Oh, tiny cap like on uh, the top of a bottle. All right, so it's bottle. not just a skin scratch type of yes. thing. It's a little deeper than that. It's slightly deeper, but you know, um, it's it's really not as people would think. Like you know, the word doesn't cut need a stitch or anything. No, not at all. Not at all. All right, and then how many? What's going to happen shortly after that session? How long does that session last for? How am I going to feel immediately after the therapy session? Okay, the, the session lasts for about half an hour. The thing is, first, um, once the incision is done, the first it's a dry tap. That's step number one. Step so it will pull the toxic back to the surface of the skin. Thereafter, I will remove that dry cup and I will sterilize the skin. Then I will make a small incision, about like I said, three, five, or seven, depending on the size of the cup. I'll reapply the cup till the blood comes out. It's usually about half a cup full, not not a your general cup. Like if they could see by how much I've got here. Um, Do you locally anesthetize no, the skin at all? Not at all. Not at all. What about pain? You know, I've got a lot of people who come to me with fear, a lot of people thinking that they're going to donate blood and they're going to be passing out. And I only do women, a lot of the husbands send them with two liter Cokes thinking that, you know, they're going to need the sugar, but it's really, really nothing like that. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's not much pain at all. It's like a needle prick. And right. funny enough, the blood comes out. Enough okay. blood comes out. Okay, so now we've done we've done the bloodletting. Yes. Um, how do you dispose of that blood, number yes. one? And also, how am I going to feel after Afterwards, that? Afterwards. Okay. Lightheaded, perhaps? Okay. Uh, it depends on your blood pressure, naturally. I, I don't take patients' blood pressure. I'm sure they're all familiar, but it's something I would like to start doing as my business grows, as I start you know, um, working with different types of people because I don't always get elderly or I don't always get sickly people as well. Um, if you are a person who suffers with low blood pressure, then you would feel slightly lightheaded. But even those who do, I'm a person who has extremely low blood pressure and I'm fine afterwards. So it depends on the person how many cups they would like to go as well. I don't have a limit for them, but generally we stop at about six to eight. Um, it's like I said, it's not a lot of blood. In regards to disposing of the blood, I keep everything per patient in a paper cup. I ask them if they would like to dispose of it themselves. So those who would like to take it and bury it themselves, they're most welcome to do so. But those who don't, I bury it myself because that's the right way to do it Islamically. Okay. Um, is one session going to be sufficient to cure me of my post-nasal drip? No, drip? definitely not. How many sessions um, would like I need? Like any treatment, you know, any medical treatment, if you go to a medical doctor, they would tell you it's a, it's a treatment. If they give you any medication, I do not um, give anyone. Just Depends, of course. Yes. Uh, it depends on the person, Julie. I cannot tell you that it would be one session. Maybe that would work for you. Some some patients, it works one session. Others, it takes them three. Others, it would take them six. Okay, we've Oops. got two minutes to wrap up time. And let's very quickly talk about, um, I see that you cover a very, very wide field of conditions. What yes. is it that you don't and wouldn't um, treat people for? What sort of conditions would they come to you and you'd say to them, I'm not qualified, or I don't think you're going to get any relief from that particular um, okay. um, first condition. First of all, a lot, in a lot of cases, I cup with caution, and every person who does cupping should cup with caution. So there's, like you get your diabetic patients, who you cup with caution, which is a minimum meaning? of... Meaning that you either put less incisions, or you do a minimum of three cups only, because it is a high risk as well. Uh, as well as your heart patients, so those who are on blood thinners, that's where I draw the line. And I do not treat heart patients as well. Because of blood thinning, naturally their blood does not coagulate. And the blood has to coagulate in the cup before we can remove the cup. That's very important. So it takes a lot of observation. As well as pregnant women. Uh, cupping, if those... If a lot of the people did not know, it induces labor. So oh. um, dry cupping is very good if someone would like to be induced into labor, if they <laughs> overturn or whatever it's called. Right. Uh, it can be done as well. But if you're pregnant, you cannot be cupped at all. So that's about it. Um, diabetes, uh, as well as breastfeeding mothers, we sort of cup them with caution because, you know, these are things that weaken you, your heart, your sugar level. Um, breastfeeding as well. So, what about we just uh, people who come to you for pain? You know, their pain threshold is very high, and they're yes, constantly yes. in pain for whatever reason. Maybe they've been in an accident. Yes. They, you know, they healed now, but they still um, have a lot of constant pain. Mm -hmm. What do you do there? Like I said, I I cap on that point. We'll have to stop there okay, to come in again. Thank you indeed. That was the lovely Zenit Kaji, and unfortunately, time's up. Perhaps we can. Uh, get her in again and talk some more on cupping. But there, she's given us a whole host of information on cupping therapy. Still to come, Ismail uh, Schuster, I'm thinking Leon Schuster. Ismail Schuster coming in to talk about apps, personal and business apps, so stay with us. Allahumma barik lana fi rajab. 
وشعبان وبلغنا رمضان Be connected to Muslims all around you. United Uma is the app that allows you to request for help as well as volunteer your services to assist those around you. Ask for help, look for jobs or services or offer jobs and help those around you. Register now by downloading our app. From paid services to free services, this app has it all. Download it now and be part of the United Umma. Darul Shifa, an abode of care, love and healing. The establishment of an elders care facility in Indonesia is required. Pledge your support for Darul Shifa's elders care facility. Don't miss the Okaf South Africa's pledge on the Friday the 13th of April 2018 from 8:30 p.m. to 12:30 a.m. Contact 0847860010 or visit www.okafsa.org.za for more information. اللهم بارك لنا في رجب وشعبان وبلغنا رمضان And don't forget we have the South African Guide Dog Association. They will be here with two guide dogs talking to us about uh, the importance of guide dogs as an aid for people with um, obviously uh, visual impairments. But right now we're going to be talking about something that goes right over my head and I think by now you should know that. We're going to be talking technology. We are living in the age of technology. It is the fourth industrial revolution and my how our lives have changed. I've just been telling Ismail off air that it seems that we all have a third hand. The third hand being a device, either remote control, a phone or whatever it is. And that is how it is um, kind of um, in our lives, um, probably easing our lives, but I think it comes at a price. Let's hear from Ismail. Ismail, just as alaykum, welcome well, to the start. program. Now, I understand you are the fundi, you are a multi-talented individual with over 20 years experience in the ICT and also, let's not forget, the industry office automation fields. What does that mean? Correct. So, um, yeah, like you said, technology has become a big part of our lives. And we're noticing now ever more that it's, at the, it's on our fingertips, basically, you know, with our mobile devices and that type of stuff. But the history of technology in South Africa is very interesting because coming from the automation field, and it's exactly that, automating things. So we know the future uh, is robotics, where we're going to see uh, AI, artificial intelligence becoming more common uh, to the households and that type of stuff. But what we're seeing currently is people looking to automate things, to, auto to make uh, processes easier. Uh, and what we find still is if, if any place is like uh, very document heavy, you know, all this type of things, they want to make it easy and simplify life for the user. Mm -hmm. And everything is about user experience. Mm -hmm. And with the new generation of users coming up, as you know, if they if they the younger generation, they just click and they expect something to happen. And if you're not adaptive to that type of trend, then all of a sudden your type of business or your uh, interface or how you interact with the user becomes obsolete. Absolutely. And that's frightening, isn't it? Yeah. Which means that people need to move with the times. Correct. They need to empower themselves, they need to educate themselves, otherwise they are going to not cope Correct. with whatever it is that is new and, um, I should imagine, at cutting edge. Uh, we talk about apps, and you just told me off air now, that yes. a lot of people don't understand what exactly is an app. Um, very especially for your business and I guess in your personal life as well. And if you don't embrace this technology, you are going to be left behind. So talk to us about apps and how relevant and important it is in business. But before we go there, give us a little bit of history about yourself. 20 years in the industry is a long time. Uh, how did you land up in this space and how did you kind of figure 
this is where I'm meant to be. Yeah. This is all, you know, I'm so comfortable. I'm in the right place at the right time and things are working for me because I understand you've won a couple of awards along the way. Yeah. You're also, um, I think you were um, responsible for a lot of training, uh, se senior uh, staff level training. And you were also a keynote speaker at various business events, international business events at yes. that. Yeah. So that tells me that you really know your stuff. Yeah, well, it, it started, it's actually weird because I was actually a law student. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that, that was my original, uh, when, I, when I finished school, I did BPROC. Uh, two years into my BPROC, I sort of realized that I was more inclined towards technology. And I got my first break with, with Canon. And Canon were offering an apprenticeship with some of these automation devices which we know as multifunctional printers and that type of stuff, but they were very advanced. So the color devices were coming onto the market. So everyone was used to printing in black and white, but in around the 1996, 97, color was becoming more popular. People wanted to print in color. So all officers felt they needed to move with the trend of now printing stuff in color. And that's where we came in. We were the first group of youngsters that were trained by Canon in an apprenticeship program to actually uh, maintain these type of devices and that's where the interest for technology came in and obviously with with the growth from analog to digital you know from the fax machine which was an analog type device moving now to a more digital device where you could actually print to these devices it wasn't just about photocopying anymore I think if you look at the stats people really photocopy they, they print more than they actually photocopy because we've gone so digital you know, so we've evolved and we haven't even noticed that we've, we've made that evolution from black and white to color. Okay, some people are still evolving. They're still getting <laughs> into the process. And right. that's why shows like this is important because we would like to tell people how to evolve into technology so that they can actually be ahead. And the difference was, at that time, technology evolution moved at a slow pace. Okay, now technology is moving at a rapid pace. Mm. So if a trend what, comes in, yes. okay, you need to get on the trend. Immediately. Immediately. There, there is no time for you to think, should my business have it or shouldn't it have it? Because your competitors are now getting onto it and they're not wasting any time with getting onto the law. Ismail, there's just so much as you speak. So yeah. many questions I want to throw it to you and I just hope we have enough time to cover it all. You're talking business here, but it impacts yeah. uh, every aspect of our lives. When you talk business, are you talking large corporates? Are you even talking the SMEs? How does, the, you know, modern or how does artificial intelligence or how does technology or apps serve a small business okay so that's probably the crux of our show today to explain the difference large corporates have budgets okay so they have large sums of budgets they can employ professionals expert teams and you'll notice now I'm not sure if I can mention some of the brands that have no, launched go their ahead. Apps, like Outsurance, mm -hmm. um, Discovery you know the big brands all of them are encouraging uh, customers and there's huge billboards out there saying, please download our app. And the most recent one I saw now was the Clicks loyalty program. So we're all familiar with loyalty programs. Yes. So like the Clicks card, we swipe it. But the inconvenience of now carrying the card. And like you said at the beginning of the show, we all have our mobile devices with us 24-7. In fact, the first thing we do when we get home <laughs> is like, look for the wall Tell plug. Tell me about Can it. Can I charge this yes. thing? You know, because if it's off, it's almost as if we switched off these days. Yeah. So that device now has become the, the key to our lives, to unlocking certain things. So like loyalty programs now, they're on the app. You get there, you open the app, your loyalty program shows you on the app. So your banking is all done via apps. So we can see there's no need to even sell the app trend from an enterprise or the large corporate side because they know that's the only way to go. The bottleneck comes in, in the SME, the small businesses, because they don't have the budgets that the large corporates actually have to develop apps. So let's, get, let's take an example, okay? Let's say a beautician, okay? She would like to have a form of communication with her customers, but it's, it's a small business. Ah. Let's say it's a single owned okay. a business. Okay. And she would like to engage with her customers, uh, specials, promotions, maybe a loyalty program like the big corporates are also offering, but there's no platform for that person. So that's why we developed a platform and a mobile app platform for small businesses where okay, they can hold, have an app. 
hold that thought. We'll come back and make the small business owner understand that in the long term, he may be quite concerned about cost implications etc but behind the long term it pays for itself yes. is Manchester is here talking to us about technology and of course you know when flux trends were in here a little while ago they too told us adapt or die as far as technology is concerned yeah. and Ismail is giving us the very same message so when we come back we're going to unpack lots more as far as personal and business apps are concerned <music> اللهم بارك لنا في رجب وشعبان وبلغنا Buy a ticket to attend GBR's 8th Annual World Congress and stand a chance to win a Hilo LX Smart Wristband. The World Congress for Trade and Investment starts on the 17th to the 20th of April 2018 at the Convention Center in Santon, South Africa. Come connect with business people, industry experts and global role players from over 80 countries for a week of networking and partnership opportunities. Tickets cost 500 Rand per day and 2,000 Rand for the whole conference. VIP tickets will cost you 1,000 Rand per day and 4,000 Rand for the full VIP experience. Esquire Technologies is a proudly South African black empowerment company and one of South Africa's leading importers and distributors of IT hardware and digital lifestyle products. Established in 1999 with the head office based in Midrand at the Esquire Digital Lifestyle Park which is an 8,000 square meter warehousing logistics center. With regional branches in Cape Town, Durban and Port Elizabeth, visit us on Facebook, Twitter or Esquire.co.za. <laughs> We're talking to Ismail Chuster, we're talking websites, we're talking apps, we're talking about the importance of embracing technology, otherwise you are going to uh, really fade away into the background and your competitors will just overtake your business. The small businessman, that's what we were talking about yes. just now, and the importance of uh, them to be embracing apps. And you've given us a great analogy about the beautician. So she has 100 customers on her books, Correct. and if she wants to do any form of advertising or promotions, she goes via her app. Yes. So, th so that's an interesting thing, right? So I met lots of people in the market, and they said, like, who would download my app? And that's an interesting question, because our perception of an app is what we see now in the App Store and in the Google Play Store. We download a game or we download some sort of utility, whatever. That's what we think an app is actually all about. And what I would say to a small business owner is that if you have one client, you would need an app to communicate with that client because client retention is just as important as getting new clients. So everyone focuses on marketing to new clients and getting new business. But what about the existing customers that have been coming to you for years? How do you communicate with them and how do you retain them? Uh, before the ad, we spoke about the loyalty program. What do we give them and how do we give back to them mm. to retain them so they continuously come to us? How do we communicate with them in a way that's not evasive? Let's take WhatsApp, for example. People are on thousands of groups these days. So they've created business groups and, and the phone just beeps the entire day. Hmm? So now what's happening now is that people are going to look for alternate ways to say, I'm not going to look at my WhatsApp anymore. But if a business that I use regularly has an app, then it's easier for me to see what's going on with that business. Like the beautician, how do I make a booking with her? Do I phone? Let's take a typical thing like a phone call. How often does a small business lose business because they drop phone calls, because they can only take one or two phone calls at a time. But with an app, you can book it online and automatically comes into an email format. So your customer now has power with the app. Okay, now let me also ask you this question. The difference between a website and an app, are you suggesting people move away from web websites as a business, as a small business perhaps, and go the app route? Or are they both important and what's the similarities or the differences? Okay, they both are important, okay? So if we take the old fashioned way, like we explained, was the business card was the original way to authenticate a business. 
These days, if someone gives you a business card, you put it aside and you go straight to their web page to see if they have a website. And if they have a website, then you start thinking, I can engage with this person or this company, especially a small business because of the risk. But now, businesses need the platform to be on a Google or I iOS platform like Apple and that type of stuff. That gives them more, uh, or gives the customer more confidence that the business is legit, that they're a good business, that they're a well-run business that they mean business. Ismail, you know? how do I protect myself? Let's assume I want to engage with a small business. Yes. Um, he has a website, he has apps, but he could still be a crook. Correct. He could still take my money and that's the last I see of him. Is there any way of me verifying that he is legit? Okay, so with, from a technology point of view, okay, if you're gonna be out in the HTTP environment, which Meaning? is the web environment, mm -hmm. Okay, you've then published yourself online. So there are thousands of businesses listed online and that type of stuff. So people can still take chances and crew, but there's costs involved to developing websites, uh, to developing apps. So these costs that a, that a crooked person needs to incur 